We're still in our series on sorry, uh, learning how to forgive. And I know this is a tender, tender type of message to give because all of us have been hurt. And all of us, if we're honest, have hurt somebody else. Maybe we didn't mean to, but we have. We've hurt other people. So we're going to be looking at this. So how badly have you been hurt? How badly have you been hurt? I said it last week, I'll say it again, that I'm not trying to drudge up things from the past. I'm talking about things that are unresolved. I'm talking about things that you still need to deal with. Maybe it's a grudge, maybe it's a hurt, whatever that is. Now, if you've already gone to somebody and asked for forgiveness and you've worked it out, I'm not talking to you. You're doing great, but I'm talking about people like me or you that maybe we still have something we need to deal with and we need to pay attention to the Lord and then do it. So how badly have you been hurt and then... How badly have you hurt someone? That's the other question, because we've all hurt people, and we may need to go back and apologize for that, to say, I'm sorry. The scripture uh, that we have here, sorry, I think I hit it too many times. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So whenever you start to think about the offense that somebody did to you, a really good thing to think is, how big was my offense toward the Son of God? And how much has He forgiven me in that offense? All of it. All of it. And he asks us to forgive those who have hurt us. And remember, forgiving them does not mean that what they did was okay. We're not sweeping that under the carpet, but we've got to forgive. We don't want to to be imprisoned by bitterness. And that can happen. Remember, I said this two weeks ago, that you being angry and holding resentment towards somebody else is like drinking poison yourself, hoping the other person that hurts you will die. You're the one that's getting sick. You're the one that's getting hurt in that. So release bitterness. Release resentment. It starts with a decision today. An unforgiving heart reveals an unforgiven heart. Last week we talked about that unmerciful servant who was forgiven $7 billion and he couldn't let go a few thousand dollars from somebody that owed him that money. And he went out and began to choke that individual. Give me my money. And he didn't have it. So he put him in jail with the torturers until he could repay it. And then... The judge said, bring that guy back in here. I forgave you $7 billion and you can't forgive some thousand dollars for your friend? Put him in the torturer's unit. And they do. See, if you're forgiven, you will be forgiving. Right? We've been forgiven for so much in our life and so therefore we must be forgiving to those around us. It's tough, I know. It's tough. In fact, Jesus said, if you do not forgive your brother, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. I need forgiveness in my life, so I better forgive. I better forgive. So we're going to take a quick journey through part of Acts. And if you want to open your Bibles to Acts 15, that's where we're going to end up. But we're going to start earlier than that, than Acts 15. And we're going to kind of jaunt through here. We're going to start way back in chapter 4. And again, you don't have to go to each passage. I'm going to jump through these pretty quickly. We'll end up in Acts 15. But here it is, Joseph. Joseph, you know Joseph, New Testament. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field and he owned and bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas is not an apostle, but he's running with the apostles. He's a disciple. He's not an apostle. There were 12 apostles. He's not one of those. He is a disciple. So he's running with the apostles. He's helping. He's working around there at the church, and he's serving, giving. He's called the son of encouragement. Isn't that a great nickname? Wouldn't you like to be called the son or daughter of encouragement? That that's what you're known for. When people think of you and your name, they think encouragement. I want to get around that person because every time I'm around that person, I am encouraged. Teens, you can do this. Be encouragers. See things in people and name it. That's what encouragement is. See people for where they are and name what's going on and encourage them. We can all do this. So this is Joseph, also called Barnabas. Barnabas, remember that name? We've got three characters we're looking at today. Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. Remember those three names. Those are the three that are going to form the hub of the sermon this morning. So Barnabas, Paul, and John Mark, okay? So Saul, or Paul, is on the road to Damascus. And he's going to persecute the Christians, right? And on the way, a bright light shines down on him, and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? 
He answered his own question. Who are you, Lord? I'm the Lord. And I want you to go and you're going to receive your sight. You're going to be an instrument for me to reach the Gentiles. Saul gets up blind, goes into Damascus, and there people come and tend to him. After three days, his sight is restored. And then the disciples don't trust Paul. They don't trust him. Wait a second here. Is this a ploy? Are you a salesman? Are you going to come in here and act like you're a Christian? They're going to grab, grab us all, tie us up, and haul us off to jail because we're Christians? So the apostles and the disciples don't trust this fella named Saul. But there was a guy that came along named Barnabas. Remember what he's known for? Encouragement. Barnabas comes to this Saul, now Paul, and he gets near him. And what does he do? He finds out that he's for real. And then he brings Saul into the apostles and says, no, listen, here's his story. Here's what happened. The same Jesus that spoke to us spoke to Saul on the road to Damascus. He's a Christian now. And they're like, are you sure, Barnabas? Barnabas like, I'm telling you, he's true blue. Trust me. They trust Barnabas. They bring Paul in. And he's now part of the believer's fellowship. That's a big deal for somebody to stand up for you. Have you ever had somebody stand up for you when the chips were down? Have you ever had somebody stand up for you when nobody else was trusting you? It goes a long way, doesn't it? If somebody will take a stand for you. Barnabas took a stand for Saul, brought him in. Praise the Lord for people like Barnabas. Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> yeah. We all need Barnabases in our life. Sorry, skipping through here. This is when they arrived in Jerusalem. Paul tried to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul's already preaching. Does he not know that he's, he's still wet? He doesn't even, what's he doing preaching? Well, he knew the law. He studied the law all his life. Now he's preaching Jesus through the law to all of these people. Verse 22, news of this, this is a Gentile revival happens. Now I'm skipping on through Acts. This news of this Gentile revival reached the church in Jerusalem. All the disciples had scattered, the apostles stayed. When Stephen was stoned, all the disciples left. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. I missed that for most of my life. I didn't realize it. I thought the apostles left too. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So now this Gentile revival happens, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. This is a Gentile area. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Just catch this. There's, there's, a, there's a dynamic of a relationship happening here. Barnabas hanging out with the apostles, now brings Saul in. Now he wants to go in search of Saul because he's gone out preaching. So Barnabas wants to find Saul, bring him to the revival because he thinks Saul can help him. Saul, Paul, same name in case this is new to you. Saul is kind of a Hebrew name and Paul is his Greek name. But he went by Paul because uh, he was speaking to a lot of Gentiles. So now we bring him down. So faith, and then Barnabas went to Tarsus, looked for Saul. When he found him, brought him to Antioch for a whole year, 12 months. Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Okay, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their work, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Here's our third character. We've got Barnabas, we've got Paul, and now we've got this third character entering the story. Here he comes. He's a younger man. His name is John, also called Mark. John is his Hebrew name. Mark is his Greek name. John Mark is what he was known by. He's also the fellow that wrote the second gospel in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the guy. This is a younger guy. He's coming along, but he's weak in his faith. Let's find out who is Mark. Who, who is John Mark? Who is this guy? Here it is. Paul says this in Colossians. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greeting, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. The cousin of Barnabas. So John Mark is related to the encourager, Barnabas. His cousin is Barnabas. Remember that, because that will play into this story, as you will see in just a moment. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, this is Acts chapter 13, so we're moving along in the narrative. So now they've been together. You've got the two guys we're talking about, Barnabas and Paul, and now you've got John Mark, the three of them. And they're worshiping the Lord with other believers. And it says, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. The church gathers. And folks, I tell you, when you're here, the Spirit speaks to us collectively. We hear messages from the Lord together. I appreciate Pastor Freddie's prayer that not only for unction and anointing for me, but for you as listener, that you'll do the word, that I, we will do the word together. So you're going to hear things collectively. So they're hearing, they hear the Spirit speak to them, set apart for me. Who's first in this list of, of names? Barnabas and Saul. Catch the order. He's first in all these, all these we've been talking about, always Barnabas and Saul, or Barnabas and Paul. Okay, moving on in the story here real quick. This is 13, 13, same chapter. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John Mark left them to return to Jerusalem. All right, this is the hinge in the whole story. Everything is going well. They're on their first of three missionary journeys. This is the first one. They're traveling around in the Mediterranean and stopping off at these ports and getting off and preaching to people, and people are getting saved. Revival's breaking out. Churches are being started. Paul, the apostle, and Barnabas, they're going, as they travel up around Cyprus, that island there in the Mediterranean, they kind of travel around that, and they hug the coast, and as they get off, they're preaching, preaching, preaching. They go to synagogues, they preach, and then they get kicked out of synagogues. And then they go out the streets and they preach to Gentiles. People are getting saved. But while they're doing this, it must have got pretty hot and heavy. The persecution was heavy. We know that from what Paul writes in Acts. They were getting stoned. They were, they were shipwrecked. They had lots of things going on in their lives. So Saul, Barnabas, John Mark, they're out there. And John Mark, something happens. The Bible doesn't say what it is. If you know, please tell me. I searched and searched. I don't know what happened. Something happened where John Mark left them. He turned his back and he said, I'm out of here. He left the mission. I don't know if it got too hard. I don't know if he got homesick. He wanted to go back to his home country there. Uh, I don't know what it was, but he left them. He turned his back. Luke, the author of Acts, doesn't tell us why he left, but it says that he left. And that upset somebody in this story. And we're going to see it here in just a moment. This is the story now. Hold on. We're going somewhere with sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Go with me to Acts 15 in your Bibles. You probably have them there. 36, verse 36. Some time later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Okay, so remember, John Mark goes home and somehow when they go back and they're still talking, John Mark comes back and he kind of regrets leaving and he comes back and he wants to join them and he wants to go with them now on a second missionary journey. That's the plot in the story. John Mark's come back now. Paul receives him, it seems like, at least right now, and Barnabas, his cousin. Let's see what happens in verse 37. Barnabas, the cousin, wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. This is a sad verse in the Bible. I don't know what to do with it. Maybe you can help me. Verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. These are spirit-filled men out doing mission work, and they have this huge disagreement. I mean, it is a huge disagreement. It's sharp. It's a sharp disagreement. They parted company. Look what happened. Barnabas took his cousin Mark and sailed for Cyprus. That's that island we talked about earlier. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Hmm, what's going on? Is this the first split that we see in the church? It's definitely a split. It's interesting how Luke pins this. Luke would have gone along probably with Paul and wrote the rest of these stories. Mark goes to hang out with Peter, Barnabas, John Mark, and Peter. That's some of the dynamics. So what's going on? What do we do with this split in the church? It's interesting how this plays out. Now, Barnabas was determined. Look at these two words that are underlined. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Those two words form this split. Barnabas determined to take him. We're taking him. Barnabas was a strong leader. He was an encourager, but he was a strong leader. Paul equally or more strong than Barnabas, he insisted that they not take him. 
Can you imagine that interchange? John Mark's just over here, maybe in earshot, and Paul and Barnabas are going at it. We're gonna take him, Paul. We're taking him, we're going on this next journey, and he's gonna come with us. He's my cousin, he's going with us. Paul's like, absolutely not. He bailed on us before. We're not taking him again. He goofed up. He needs to learn his lesson. We're going on without him. And they bickered. It doesn't say how long. It, it could have been a day. Well, we're, we need to pray about it. They both pray. They come back. We're not taking him. Yes, we are. <laughs> you ever do that as a couple in marriage? We're, let's go pray about it. You come back with the same answers. I'm like, Rrr. God, what are you doing? God, what, what's the answer? God doesn't say. The last thing we hear is that Paul and Barnabas were commissioned by the church in Acts 13, 13 to go and share the gospel. And that's what they're doing. But as they're going, something happens. Oh man, what do we do with this John Mark? He bailed on us. Now he's back. What do we do? I don't know what you think in this story. Do you side more with Paul or with Barnabas? I think it's interesting because we need both in the church. We need both there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. They just spent all of Acts chapter 15 debating about Gentiles and them coming to faith. So they're, they're strong on doctrinal issues, the teaching issues. They're strong about, you don't have to be circumcised to be a believer. They, they, they got rid of all those rules and they're saying, we're strong, it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ that you're saved. They, they fought off all those battles and now they get to this battle that's not even about doctrine. It's not even about anything in the scriptures. It's about preferences. Paul says no. Barnabas says yes. What do they do? They split. They split. Which side are you on? Who's right? Who's wrong? We always want to know that, right? Luke is so good at writing this, he does not disclose to us if there was any error at all. He just writes it out. This is what happened. Now, if I were Paul, I don't know if I'd want this, or Barnabas, I don't think I'd want that fight mentioned in Scripture. Do you want your fights mentioned in the newspaper? I mean, their fight was mentioned in Holy Writ. It's there for all to see, this dispute they have. Barnabas determined to take with them John, and the Greek word determined is in the imperfect tense, and it means he consistently and persistently determined. He just wouldn't back off to take John, whose surname was Mark. We're going to take him. We're going to take him. Paul, we're taking John Mark. He's my cousin. He's coming with us. I'm the son of encouragement. Remember what I did for you, Paul? I stood up for you. Can you imagine the interchange? And Paul's like, yeah, but I didn't back out on the gospel. We're not taking him. Yes, we are, Paul. So he determined. It, it means it's over and over. He's just, we're going to take him. Paul, I don't care. We're taking him with us on this ship. We're not leaving until he gets in the boat with us. You got me? I'm not getting on that ship if he doesn't get on the ship. And Paul's like, well, you aren't getting on the ship then. And Paul, they, they draw sides right there in Holy Scripture. Paul thought it not good to take him with them who departed from them. The word there comes from a root which means apostasy. He wasn't a theological or a doctoral apostate. He was a service apostate. He put his hand to the plow and then he looked back. I think that's probably what Paul's thinking. Here's another scripture that came to my mind. This is Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Paul saying, we needed you, John Mark. Where were you? You bailed on us. When it got hot, you left. You quit. You're out of here. I mean, he's a hard nose. I mean, he's just like, Phew. because Paul knew they're going out to face imprisonment. They're going out to face martyrdom, maybe. They're going out to face stoning and persecution. And he said, we can't have people who are going to bail on us like that. You got to stay strong. Stay in the faith. Stay in the fight. And Barnabas is like, yeah, but give him a second chance. Any of you need a second chance in your life? <laughs> I, I can see both sides, can't you? I can see both sides. I can see, ah, man, what do you do here? So what happens is they do split ways. Paul considered that someone who had abandoned them in an earlier ministry could not be trusted to join their company again and would not consent while Barnabas refused to continue his ministry to Paul if John Mark was not permitted to encourage them. Remember, he's the son of encouragement. We're going to keep him around. Give him a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. So who was right, Paul or Barnabas? Door number one or door number two? Luke never tells us. There are disagreements sometimes that happen 
And we want to find fault. We want to find blame. We want to say, this is right, this is wrong. But in this case, Luke doesn't give that to us. Sometimes, even in the church, people can get upset about things that are not doctrinal, and they can bail and go off and do something else in another church and really make it go great. We'd go, well, can't you work it out before you go? Can't you at least say sorry? Come on, can't you hug and make up at least before you bail? I mean, who's right? I love Paul, I love Barnabas, but man, they're not hugging. They are not hugging right now. They're on different ships, going different directions right now. Who was right? I want to find out who's right so I can make a judgment. That's what we're good at, right? We make judgments, right? Give me the facts, I'll make a judgment. But the Bible doesn't let us make a judgment. We'll see some, a few other things here that will help us a little bit, I think, with this. So verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. I mean, I don't think they came to blows, fisticuffs, but I think there are some red faces, some blood vessels sticking out on the side of the neck. I think there was some at one another. Why do you have to be so hard-nosed, Paul? Why do you have to give such second chances, Barnabas? He'll bail on us again, then we'll be hurt again, then what? I just want you to feel this. I'm doing this on purpose to get us to feel what can happen even in good churches. Good churches. People have strong opinions in different directions, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes somebody leaves. I don't think Paul was wrong, and I don't think Barnabas was wrong. They had a difference of opinion, and they split up. Who you side with would probably determine how you would respond in that same situation. So contention was so sharp, they parted. I mean, it was sharp, sharp, sharp. This word is only used a few times in the New Testament. Paul chose Silas and departed while being committed by the brothers under the grace of the Lord. That may tell us something. The church commended Paul. It didn't say they commended Barnabas. Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brothers under the grace of the Lord. The church recognized the duo of Paul and Silas, and perhaps they had the mind of the Spirit on that, as so, and so they commended them. We don't know that for sure. We don't know, because the Bible doesn't say, it does say that they commended them. This word provoke, or the sharp disagreement, three times as I said, here's one of them, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoke one another to good works. Provoke one another to good works? You mean, provoke somebody? Hey, how come you haven't been in church? Hey, lay off, brother. I, uh, I was on vacation for the last six weeks. Hey, everybody needs a break. <laughs> Provoke. Why weren't you there, brother? You're a Christian. We need you there. Your gift was not being able to be used because you weren't there. Provoke one another? The Bible says to provoke one another. I don't know, Dana, can you be put in jail for provoking somebody? Uh, if it gets too hot, I guess you probably could. The Bible says to provoke one another Provoke unto love. Provoke somebody to love and to good deeds, to get off their chair and to go serve the Lord. Sometimes, folks, we need to be provoked to serve. We need somebody to encourage us. That's Barnabas' word, or Paul's word is provoke. <laughs> provoke us to good works, to love and good works. The other time it's used is Paul. He uses it in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love is not easily provoked. Hmm. What if he's thinking about that with John Mark? Love is not easily provoked. All right, this is some good news. 1 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul would later affectionately mention Barnabas as being worthy of monetary support in his work proclaiming the gospel. Oh, I love resolution. I don't like it when they're apart. Come on, somebody need a hug. We need, we need to give somebody a hug here, right? And, and you think Paul and Barnabas need reconciliation. And Paul, in his, one of his letters to the Corinthians, he says, Make sure you're giving money, supporting Barnabas in his work. That's good news. So it's like Paul is kind of putting out a little bit of a, an olive branch. Maybe, maybe Paul thought, maybe I was a little, he was a little bit too hard on John Mark. But, but maybe Paul being that hard on John Mark led him to write the gospel, Mark. <laughs> we don't know. So Paul, prior to his martyrdom, he pens these words. This is right before his death. And look at the last thing he's saying here. He writes this. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Oh, it's like, thank you. All that time, we don't know how long, it was over 10 years, they were separated. And now Paul's saying, bring John Mark back to me. He's useful to me. 
Maybe Paul mellowed a little bit. Do you, get, do you mellow as you get older? You're too mellow to answer. <laughs> I'm voting. Do you, get, do you get mellowed as you get older? We do. I think Paul mellowed. The things we're so strong on and hard on when we're young, we kind of, we may ease up a little bit as we get older. When I was young, I wanted to die on every mountain. I, I wanted to die on every cliff. I, it was something to die over. And the older I get, there's less and less that I'm willing to die over. It's like, I, I don't care. Go ahead. That math is bad for you, but hey, it's your life. I mean, <laughs> There are less and less things. I'm getting more mellow. Now, here's, here's the trick. Don't mellow out of the kingdom. Don't get so mellow and vanilla you fall out of the kingdom. you got to stay in the word of God. And you, you can have open mind to things, but don't fall out of the kingdom. Don't become so open-minded that your brain falls out, right? You can be mellow, but have convictions at the same time. Have convictions about the right things. Here, I got this from God Questions. Here were two godly men, Paul and Barnabas, loved by the churches, filled with the Spirit, enduring persecution together, seeing people saved and enjoying an effective ministry, yet they were fallible and did not see eye to eye on everything. They quarreled and parted ways. Even the best and most faithful among us are prone to interpersonal conflicts and mistakes. We are all fallen human beings. The ministries of both men continued. That's the good news. In fact, the number of missionary teams doubled. God can use even our disagreements to further his work. Amen. Amen. You may be here because you got kicked out of another church. Well, praise the Lord, you're here. <laughs> we'll keep you for a while anyway. No, I'm kidding. We'll, we'll keep you. Sometimes things happen and, and we can't make them right because it's just a difference of, agree, a difference of personality or a difference of preference. Now, if there's doctrinal issues that you've messed up on, you need to say sorry for that. If you've hurt somebody, you need to go back and apologize. But sometimes people just split up. This is a tough, tough deal. This is life. This is where we live today. This dissension between Paul and Barnabas was not over a doctrinal issue. The rupture involved a personal dispute based upon a judgment call. To their credit, neither Paul nor Barnabas let the conflict distract them from their respective efforts of spreading the gospel. Isn't that good news? Sometimes people can get hurt like, I quit. And you quit the church and then you quit Christianity. That's not good. You can have disagreements, have disagreements, have sanctified disagreements. But at the end of the day, make sure you stay about the mission. Keep winning souls to Jesus. Don't let Satan sidetrack you because of your hurt that you never talk to people about Jesus anymore. Well, I'm so sick of that pastor. He hurt my feelings. I'm not going to talk to anybody about Jesus. What? Where did that come from? You can disagree agreeably and go on with the mission of the gospel. Go on out and share your faith with those around you. What about you? Are you letting something or someone stop you from spreading the gospel? Well, that church may just did me wrong. And I'm going to show them how wrong they were because I'm never going to go to church. And I'm just going to wither away as an old grumpy person. <sighs> And you wonder why nobody's coming to faith with your attitude like that. <laughs> Who wants to be around that? But to say, you know what? I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to disagree agreeably. And I'm willing to move on and continue to share the love of Jesus with those around us. Have you been hurt? You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. Friends, it's killing you to hold on to that. You're not the person God created you to be when you're holding on to those grudges and that resentment. But pastor, they erred. They sinned again. I know. I'm not saying what they did was right, but you've got to let it go. You maybe need to talk to somebody, a counselor, a pastor, a good Christian friend who can help you get through that to get to the other side. Folks, don't let Satan hoodwink you. Don't let that old devil deceive you into thinking you can't ever make it right. Say, Lord, with your help, I'm going to do it. With your help, I'm going to do it. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together for a closing song.